Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Vicharine Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Prasthacha Deji Karine Om Namo Bhagavate Vatsudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskrityam Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narottamam Naram Chaiva Narottamam Devim Sarasati Vyasam Devim Saraswati Vyasam 
jaya mudiraya tato jaya mudiraya nasta praeshu badreshu nasta praeshu badreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama shloke bhagavati uttama shloke bhakti naishtaki bhakti bhavati naishtaki we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, chapter number 52, entitled Rukmini's Message to Lord Krishna, text number 19. Bhagavan Shrotam Echami Krishna Shyam Krishna Shyamita Tejasa Yatam Magada Salvadin Jedva Kanyam Upaharat Bhagavan Shrotam Ichami Krishna Shyamita Tejasa Yata Magada Salvata Din Jitva Kam Yam Ipaharat Bhagavan Shrotam Ichami Krishna Shyamita Tejasa Yata Magada Salvadin Jitva Kanyam Paharat Bhagavan Shrotam Ichami Krishna Shyamita Tejasa Yata Magada Salvadin Jitva Kanyam Paharat Marriages. Nobody. Bhagavan. Bhagavan. O Lord. Lord. Sukadeva Goswami. Sukadeva Goswami. Shrotam. Shrotam. To hear. To hear. Ichami. Ichami. I wish. I wish. Krishna Shya. Krishna Shya. About Krishna. About Krishna. Amita, Amita, immeasurable, immeasurable, Tejasa, Tejasa, whose potency, whose potency, Yata, Yata, how, how, Magada, Magada, Sarva Adin, Salva Adin, such kings as Jarasandha and Salva. Such kings as Jarasandha and Shalva, Jitva, Jitva, defeating, defeating, Kanyam, Kanyam, the bride, the bride, Upaharat, Upaharat, he took away, he took away. Translation, Maharaj Pariksit, oh, yeah, Maharaj Pariksit says, 
My Lord, I wish to hear how the immeasurably powerful Lord Krishna took away his bride while defeating such kings as Magadha and Saul Shalva. You can repeat. My Lord, my Lord, I wish to hear. I wish to hear how the immeasurably powerful, how the immeasurably powerful Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna took away his bride, took away his bride while defeating, while defeating such kings, such kings as Magadha, as Magadha and Shalva, and Shalva, purport by the disciples of. His Divine Grace Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. We should not think that Sri Krishna was actually afraid of Jarasandha. In the very next chapter, we will find that Sri Krishna easily Sri Krishna easily defeats Jarasandha and his soldiers. Thus, we should never doubt the supreme prowess of Lord Krishna. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Milikamina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manoristam Svapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kakamayam Dadati Svaparantitam Bandeham Shri Kara Shri Yata Parakamala Shri Karan Vaishnavamsya Shri Rupan Sakrajatam Svahakana Radhanata Vitam Tam Sajivam Sarvaitam Savadutam Arijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Tashri Shakaita He Krishna Karina Sindhu Tina Bandhu Chagatvate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Pratapaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hadiye Vancha Kaupata Rupyascha Vipasindu Vaye Vancha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Kadadhar Shri Vasadi Kaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Krishna. We are very honored to play our church. We are very honored to play our church. We are very honored to play our church. We are
And my Lord, how the immeasurable, powerful Lord Krishna took away his bride while defeating the kings such as Magadha and Shalva. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear about Lord Krishna's pastimes. He heard how Lord Krishna had uh, performed the Ranchur pastime, leaving the battlefield as if in fear of Jarasandha. So that was bewildering pastime. And Jarasandha was so proud the, although Lord Krishna had defeated his army 17 times and sent Jarasandha away 17 times, humiliated him. On the 18th occasion, another king named Kalayavana came and Lord Krishna considered the situation that there's two great armies. One was Jarasandha's army and the other was his Kalayavana. And they were both coming to attack Mathura. So Lord Krishna considered the situation. And at that time, he moved all the inhabitants of Mathura to Dwarka in order to save them from any danger from these very nasty kings. So Lord Krishna then performed this Ranchur pastime leaving the battlefield as if he's uh, afraid of Jarasandha. Jarasandha was actually thinking that Krishna is afraid of me, you see, and so powerful. Maya is so subtle that even though Jarasandha had been beaten 17 times by Lord Krishna, he's thinking, now he's afraid of me, you see, he's running away from me because he knows I'm going to beat him this time. So this is the power of Maya, that we can be so ignorant, so much in illusion. Anyway, Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear how Lord Krishna managed to take away his bride, because at the time of the marriage, uh, initially Rukmini was to be married to Sishupala, and Rukmini had a brother, the eldest brother of Rukmini was Rukmi. Actually, there were five brothers, all sons of Maharaj Bhishmaka, the father. So five brothers and one sister. So Rik, Rukmi, he was a friend of Sishupal, and he arranged for the marriage of his sister Rukmini to Sishupal. Now Maharaj Bhishmaka, he, he didn't like it very much, but you know, just like Dhritarashtra, Dhritarashtra was very much controlled by his oldest son, Duryodhan. Whatever Duryodhan said and did, Dhritarashtra would go along with it, even though he knew sometimes the things Duryodhan did were not very good, but because Duryodhan was his oldest son, he would always support him. 
So similarly with Bhishmaka, his eldest son Rukmi, he wanted to marry Rukmini to Sishupal. And Maharaj Bhishmaka, he thought that Krishna would be a better husband for Rukmini because he, he'd heard about, they'd all been hearing about Lord Krishna and his wonderful pastimes. And Rukmini, she'd never met Lord Krishna, but she'd heard about him because she's a daughter of Bhishmaka Maharaj, Bhishmaka, and they're living in the palace. And from time to time, great saintly persons will come there and visit the palace. Great sages like Narada and Angira and Vyasa and that, they would all come sometimes to visit. And so she would hear about the glories of Lord Krishna from these people. And by hearing about Lord Krishna, Rukmini decided that she wanted to have Lord Krishna for her husband. But her brother is arranging her marriage to Sishupal. So how to, what to do about this? So Rukmini wrote a letter to send to Lord Krishna and she gave it to a Brahmana to take the letter to Dwarka. You know, there was no mobile phone and apparently she didn't have any parrots that she could send the parrots like Radha and Krishna and Braja, they will send parrots between each other, messages with the parrots. But apparently Rukmini didn't have that opportunity, but she had a Brahmana and she sent the Brahmana to do, go to Dwarka to deliver her message to Lord Krishna. So, in the message, she explained, you know, just could you imagine if you're a young man and a woman writes you a letter like this, like Rukmini wrote to Lord Krishna, and she tells Lord, well, first of all, of course, she, te she, she understands that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Rukmini herself is the Goddess of Fortune. She is Laksh, Mahalakshmi, who's come to take part in the pastimes of the Lord. Anyway, she writes a letter expressing her desire that she wants to marry Lord Krishna. She wants Krishna to become her husband. And she said to Krishna that if I cannot fulfill my desire in this life, then I'm willing to take birth many times again until I can achieve my desire. Not only did she express her desire like this, but she also explained to Krishna the situation that I'm supposed to be married to Sishupal. Now, Sishupal is a relative of Lord Krishna. They're cousins. And Sishupal is also from a royal family and he's very powerful. But he was always defeated by Krishna. You know, sometimes you get that kind of competition. You know, there's somebody, they always beat you. Maybe doesn't matter if it's cricket or football or mathematics or whatever you're doing, but somehow they always do better than you. So Krishna was like that to Sishupal. He would always do better than Sishupal. So there was a lot of envy in the heart of Sishupal. But anyway, he was thinking he's going to get married to Rukmini. And Rukmini was so beautiful that all the young kings and the princes, whenever they would see her, they would swoon, they would faint. Oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, who is the lucky man who's going to have her for her wife, for his wife? 
So she was so charming and so attractive. All the king, all the kings and princes, they all wanted Rukmini. But it was arranged that Sishupa was supposed to get her, supposed to be married to Sishupa. You know, other queens and so on, they would have Swayambara ceremony. They would they were supposed to select their own husband, the man they wanted to marry. For a very, very qualified woman, they would invite the kings and princes to come for a Swayamvara ceremony, and the girl would choose who they wanted to marry. But sometimes, sometimes it would happen that some man would just come and take her, pick her up and take her away. Just like, uh, just like the, the son of Jambavati. What's the name, son of Jambavati? Huh? Samba. Samba, yes, Samba. Samba, the son of Jambavati. He wanted to marry Duryodhana's daughter, Lakshman. And she was having a Swayamvara ceremony. But Samba knew she will never pick me. <laughs> Samba knew she's not going to pick me for a husband. Somehow, Samba doesn't have a very good reputation. <laughs> but anyway, he thought, I want to marry her. So when it came time for a Swayamvara ceremony, he just picked her up <laughs> and walked off with her. And then there was a big battle and they chased after him and they captured him and brought him back. And Lord Balaram had to come and negotiate. Lord Balaram at that time, he took his plow, he was going to drag Hastinapur into the Yamuna River. And so then they understood they better do what Lord Balaram said. So then they, they brought uh, Samba and this Lakshmana and they said, okay, take, take them. So Lakshman got his wife that he wanted. Uh, Samba, rather, Samba got his wife, got Lakshmana, who was Duryodhana's daughter. Anyway, Rukmini doesn't have that opportunity somehow. There's no Swayamvara ceremony for her. It's arranged by the older brother. And that's quite common. And even today in Hindu society, you get the young ladies, their father will arrange the marriage. Or maybe the older, the eldest brother will arrange the marriage. And the girl does not have any real independence. She has to just simply go along with it. The family, just tell her, you have to do it. You marry this boy. There was no question of, no, no, I don't want to marry him. There was no love marriage. That, that's, now you see so much divorce because there's love marriage. But in those days, there was no divorce. Anyway, these are royal families. These are all people in very high level in society. Their marriages are like that. So Lord Krishna received the message from Rukmini and Rukmini had told Lord Krishna how he could get her, how he could kidnap her. And she explained that before, I ma before my marriage to Sishupal, we have the custom to go to the temple of Amba or Ambika, go to the temple of Ambika and worship her. And she said, at that time, I'll come out of the palace to go to the temple. So at that time, that would be a good time to kidnap me, to come and take me. Come and take me as your wife. So Rukmini, she has that bhav. She has that bhav, that Atmani Vedana. Atmani Vedana, full surrender to Krishna. Right? We know about Bali Maharaj, he surrendered everything to Krishna. But Rukmini, she also surrendered everything to Krishna. She told Krishna, just come and take me, make me your bride. 
So Rukmini not only had the mood of Atmani Vedana, but she also had that bhava for Krishna. Bali Maharaj doesn't have that kind of bhava. But Rukmini, she has that bhava for Krishna. And she wrote to Krishna expressing her mood to just simply surrender and to be taken by Krishna. So when Krishna went there for the marriage, you know, all of Sishupala's friends were there. And among them was Jarasandha. Now, who is Jarasandha? Understand, Jarasandha was the father-in-law of Kamsa. <laughs> His daughters had all married Kamsa. And when Krishna killed Kamsa, then all of his daughters came home to their father. <laughs> oh, Krishna killed our husband. You know, because their, their husband's dead. So what do they do? They have to go home to their father. They went back to Jarasandha and they told Jarasandha, Krishna came and killed, he killed our husband. We're widows now. Our life is ruined. Jarasandha. That was why Jarasandha had attacked Krishna so many times. Anyway, uh, Jarasandha was only one king who was at the wedding of Sishupal. But there were many other kings. And among them was also Salva. The Shalva. The Shalva. He was a very powerful demon. He had all kinds of mystic powers and he was a master in magic and creating illusions. So I'll tell you about what happened with Shalva. Uh, you know, just imagine how powerful Lord Krishna was. All of these kings were there. And they were all there to support Sishupal. Now Jarasandha himself, Jarasandha had the strength of 10,000 elephants. He was so powerful. He was so powerful that when Lord Krishna, you know, before, before, before uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira could perform the Rajasuya Yagna, they had to get, uh, they had to get supremacy over all the ruling kings. So Jarasandha would never recognize Maharaj Yudhisthira as the ruling, as the emperor. So before they could perform the Rajasuya Yagna, they first of all had to defeat Jarasandha. So what to do? So it happened that. Uh, Lord Krishna, along with Bhima and Arjuna, they disguised themselves as Brahmanas because they know the nature of Jarasand, that this Jarasand is very clever person, he's very powerful, he's got the strength of 10,000 elephants, but he's also very clever. He knows to give charity to Brahmanas. He knows that if you give to the brahmanas, it will come back, right? <laughs> we, we get life members like that, you know. <laughs> you get people, they're doing business, you know. Sometimes people, there's some people like that, they do business and they say, I know that if I give to Krishna, it will come back many times. So, Jarasandha was not giving to Krishna, he was giving to Brahmanas. Just like Bali Maharaj had been told by Shukracharya, give to the Brahmanas. And so when Lord Vamanadev came as a Brahmana, Bali Maharaj wanted to give. But Shukracharya said, no, don't give him, he's Vishnu. He's Vishnu, he'll take everything away. Because Shukracharya was that kind of guru. He was a material guru. Shukracharya thought, if, if he takes everything away, there'll be nothing left for me. 
But, you know, and Bali Maharaj is maintaining me. But if, if Vishnu comes, it's this Vamana Dev, and he takes everything, who will maintain me? So materialistic gurus, they're thinking like that. They're not spiritual gurus. So Shukracharya was that kind of guru. He was telling Bali Maharaj, don't give it. But Bali Maharaj thought, well, if he is God, he can take it anyway. So it's better I give him than he takes it. Because if he takes it, he gets, and I don't get any credit. But if I give to him, I get the credit that I gave. I gave charity. And so that's why Bali Maharaj gave. Even though his guru told him, don't give him. He disobeyed the guru for the higher purpose, for the, to give pleasure to the Supreme Lord. So if your guru tells you, don't give to Krishna, don't surrender, then don't listen to that guru. He's not the real guru. He's just some, like he's another Shukracharya. <laughs> he's saying, don't give. Anyway, Jar Bhima, Arjuna, and Krishna, they all came dressed as brahmanas. And they said, we want charity. And Jarasandha is looking at them. He thought, these are brahmanas? He thought, they don't look like brahmanas. They're so strong. Bhima is so powerful. And, Arjuna, and he could see the mark on their shoulders where they've been carrying weapons, where they would carry their bow and so on. There are marks on the shoulder of the Kshatriya. Not only that, but their voices were like thunder. You know, Kshatriyas, they have that Ishwara Ba. They have that power in their voice, you know. Just, <laughs> you, know, but you, know you get people like that, you know, they're so powerful, you know. When, oh, yes, yes, you know. You, so Jarasandha saw Bhima and Arjuna with Lord Krishna. And he thought, these are brahmanas? What unusual brahmanas. Usually brahmanas are skinny, you know, vidya vinaya, learned and gentle, you know, but these people were <laughs> very different from brahmanas. Anyway, he said, anyway, what do you want? You want charity? Tell me what you want. He said, I'm ready. I'll give you my own head if that's what you want. They said, no, we don't want your head. We just want a fight. And then they revealed who they are. They revealed themselves that this is Lord Krishna, this is Arjuna, this is Bhima. The Jarasena said, ah! And then became angry. He said, all right, you want to fight? But I'm not going to fight with Arjuna. He's too weak. He's not strong enough for me. He won't give a good fight for me. The Kshatriyas, they like to fight somebody who will give them a good fight. They don't want somebody who is inferior to them, too easy for them. They want somebody who will give them a good battle. So Jarasana said, Arjuna, no, no. And Krishna, he's a coward. He ran away from me. I'm not going to fight a coward. He said, I'll fight Bhima. He looks like he can give me a good fight. Bhima also has the strength of 10,000 elephants. So in this way, Bhima and Jarasandha, they got together and they had a fight. And they were fighting like 27 days. And Bhima was becoming discouraged, he thought, you know, I, do, I don't think I can beat him. He's very powerful, very strong. They would hit each other, but nobody could win. But then Lord Krishna gave the secret, of course. Lord Krishna revealed to Bhima how to defeat Jarasandha. He told him, he, Lord Krishna picked up a twig and he split it down the middle. He said, just like this, he said, Jara Sanda. He was born in two halves. He was born in two halves. And when, they, when he was born, the two halves, they, the mother threw them away. They thought, this is useless. 
This is not a child. But the two halves were found by a witch named Jara. And that witch, she joined the two halves together. In this way, Jara Sunda was formed. The, he was originally just two halves. The body was not complete, it was in two halves. But Jara Sanda, this witch, Jara, she joined the two together and made this person Jara Sanda and made him with, with, the, with all of her magic power, she made him very strong, like 10,000 elephants. So Bhima understood by the grace of Lord Krishna how to defeat, defeat Jara Sanda. So he came forward and he stood on one foot of Jarasanda and grabbed his other foot and ripped him up and ripped him right down the middle, right down the middle, two halves. At each half, there was, there was one ear <laughs> and one earring. There was one leg. There was one testicle <laughs> like this. He ripped him right in two. So... This way, Bhima defeated Jara Sanda. Although he was so, then Maharaj Yudhisthira could go on and perform the Rajasuya Yagna. So Jara Sanda, he was one of the kings there when Krishna came to kidnap Rukmini, and there was this other king, Shalva, as well as many others. But Shalva was there, and Shalva was also. I said he was very expert in magic. And what he did was, after Krishna stole Rukmini, he was so angry that he went and did penance. And for one year, he would just eat dirt. He would only eat dirt. He'd take a handful of dirt and he would eat that. And for one year, he did that. And in this way, Lord Shiva appeared to him. And then Lord Shiva, of course, wants to know, what benediction do you want? What blessing do you want? So Shalva told him, I want to have a, an airplane, a, a flying fortress that I can fly in the sky and I can attack my, I can defeat my enemies. So Lord Shiva, he gave this flying fortress to Shalva. And Shalva then went to attack Dwarka. Now at the time Shalva went to attack Dwarka, Lord Krishna was not there. He was away to Hastinapur. And Lord Krishna's sons were there, headed by Prajumna. So Prajumna came out and he fought with Shalva. And they had a great fight. Somehow that there was another person who was a, one of the assistants of Shalva, he came and he hit Prajumna and knocked him unconscious. At that time, uh, the, the servant of Prajumna took Prajumna away from the battlefield. And when Prajumna recovered, he was very angry. He said, why did you do that? Why did you take me away from the battlefield? You should never do that. Kshatriya, they never want to leave the battlefield. Anyway, Prajumna recovered, and by that time, Lord Krishna had come back. And Lord Krishna came and heard how Shalva was attacking there. So this Shalva was very expert. He had this flying fort which he was going in. And then what happened was he arranged, one Brahmana came there and told Lord Krishna that, Shalva went to Mathura and kidnapped your father. He has your father, Vasudeva, prisoner. And then it happened, Shalva appeared and he was holding this person. And it, the person looked just like Krishna's father. He was just like Vasudeva. And Shalva took his sword and he cut off, he decapitated him, he cut off the head of this person who looked like Vasudev. And Lord Krishna was watching it. Lord Krishna, although Lord Krishna is omniscient, he knows everything. 
but he was playing the part of an ordinary person. And he appeared to be affected that, oh, oh, he's killed my father, he's killed Vasudev. But it was all illusion. This Shalva was so powerful, he could do all of these kind of magic tricks. So then Lord Krishna, anyway, he came back and fought and he des destroyed that aeroplane of Shalva. And then he fought with Shalva and using his Sudarshan chakra, he cut off the head of Shalva and defeated him. So these, these kings, these demons who come and fight with Lord Krishna, they're all very powerful, special people. Of course, when they're killed by Krishna, then they get impersonal liberation. They enter into the Brahma Jyoti, which is not a bad destination for demons, you know. The demons, they get to enter into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti, and they will remain there for some time. And after some time, they come back, take another birth. Anyway, these are these two kings are mentioned here in this verse. It said, because Maharaj Parikshit knew about this Jarasan, the king of Magadha. The king of Magadha. Where is it, Magadha? Anybody know? Bihar. Bihar, huh? So Bihar. So he was the king there, and uh, Shalva also. Two very powerful kings. And he's wondering, how could Krishna manage to kidnap Rukmini with all of those kings there? And they had all come to the wedding just to guard Rukmini. They came there to guard her so that Shishupal could marry her. But still, Lord Krishna outsmarted all of them. And he came there and he took away Rukmini in the presence of all of those kings. Lord Krishna is just like the lion who comes in the presence of the jackals. The lion doesn't worry about jackals. He will simply take the, the bait, the, 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 the whatever is there for offering. But those kings, they said, oh, Krishna, he's like a jackal. In the presence of all of us lions, he's come here and he's taken away Rukmini. So they reversed the whole thing. They said, Krishna's like the jackal and we're the lions. <laughs> but actually it was Krishna who was the lion and they were all just like jackals. So Lord Krishna took away Rukmini. He took her back to Dwarka and then in Dwarka they had to marry. So Rukmini became the first queen of Lord Krishna. Lord Balaram had already married. He had accepted Rivati as his wife. And now Lord Krishna's getting married, entering into family life. Dwarka. Dwarka, Lord Krishna, enjoys family life with all of his queens. And the very first queen was Rukmini. So later on, Lord Krishna jokes with Rukmini that, you know, I shouldn't have taken you. There were so many other kings wanting to marry you. And, you know, I'm only a cow. I'm only from the cowherd family. In fact, people don't even know my origin. I don't have any cows myself. My father has all the cows. I don't think I'm fit to be your husband. Better you go back to your father or you go and maybe some other man will accept you. I'm not worthy to be your husband. And when Krishna speaks like that to Rukmini, then Rukmini faints. She cannot even bear the thought of love. And at this time they were grandparents. They were not young. They were already grandparents, although they looked young. But Lord Krishna never grows older. He's always Kishore. He's always in that Kishore period, like a young man, never grows old. He's Nava Yogana, eternally youthful. 
and Rukmini also didn't grow old. Okay, any question? Yes? Yes, well, <laughs> that's family life. There's always problems in the family life. You cannot expect that you can be in the family life and not have problems. It's always difficult, definitely things like marriage. When it comes to marriage, it's very difficult to make decisions and these things. But there's it's, there is some standard there like that, you know, that if the father is old and the son, the eldest son is grown up and mature, then the eldest son is like the head of the family and the father is more retired. The father is just like, you know, Vanaprastha. So the daughter comes under the care of the eldest brother. So it's the, it's the eldest brother's affair to get them married rather than the father. And you see Prabhupada actually, when Srila Prabhupada left home, he had also a daughter not yet married. But he thought, let the brothers take care, get her married. Prabhupada left home. So like that, that you have to understand, we ha you just have to accept what is the, the will of providence. You know, some kind of destiny is there which arranges these things. You may not like, but you know, that's not... Just like I remember in Prabhupada's time, there was these girls coming, Indian family, you know, and these girls, they were complaining that we don't want to marry the boys our father is saying we should marry. <laughs> but Prabhupada said, don't think any of my disciples will make you a good husband. <laughs> of course, at that time, Prabhupada's disciples were all Westerners, you know. But Prabhupada told them, you should get married what, who your father tells you. You should, you should accept the arrangement, your father or your brother, you should accept that. Don't think you know better. That's the fault. The girl thinks, I know better. I don't want that boy. I want this boy. You know, 
it, it's better for them to follow the father or the brother and go along with that rather than just go by their own whims and their own feelings and sentiments. It's better that they don't try to decide for themselves, but they should follow the arrangement of the family. So for the girl, that's the system, the family arrange. Love marriages, uh, uh, uh. passion, the mode of passion, the result of the mode of passion, distress, ends in distress. So better the mode of goodness. Act according to religious principle. Thank you so much for sharing the, the idea that is my question was about weakness of heart. Weakness of heart, which is one of the given that old Brahma said, looking in the will of Krishna, how can we as Dharma overcome this weakness of heart? There is also a full ego that has been by Krishna and the Maya also. How do we do Krishna and not Maya? Well, you know, we're not in that situation of the old Brahmana. It's difficult for us to, you know, for me to compare the old Brahmana to our situation. You know, you're a Brahmachari, you don't have the prop, you're not in the situation of that old Brahmana. You don't have a wife and family and a daughter. So your weakness of heart doesn't have much in common with his weakness of heart. But the weak, weakness of heart is simply our attachment to material things. I don't know, maybe you have an old mother and you have some weakness of heart. You think about my old mother. So how do we overcome that kind of weakness of heart? Well, simply by cultivating spiritual knowledge. We have to see everything in relation to the scriptures understand everyone as the spirit soul and understand that whatever devotional service you're doing, your mother will also enjoy the benefit of that, that you can often give the results of your pious activity, the results of your seva, you can give them for the benefit of your mother, that she can also be delivered from material life. So you have to think like that. What can you do? You know, we have weakness of heart. It's just simply attachment to the ephemeral, attachment to things which are illusory and temporary. And we have to overcome them by spiritual knowledge, by taking shelter of the holy name. You can conquer over this these weakness of heart. One of the devotees used to say, we're training our gladiators to conquer the mind in the arena of japa. So that weakness of heart is coming due to the mind. So we have to conquer over the mind by japa, by chanting very carefully and very attentively and loudly and powerfully and purely with the power of the holy name, we will overcome all the weakness of heart. Devotional service itself, any anga of bhakti will help us to remove that weakness of heart. But especially the chanting of the holy name.
Is that better? Which state? Well, somebody may come and they may surrender for everything in the beginning. They may come to the Krishna consciousness and they may give everything what they have, but they may not have given their full mind to Krishna. They may have given their material possessions, but they never really give their full mind to Krishna. They come to Krishna and they give their material assets, they may give their land, they may give their property, they may give these things up, but they don't actually give up the mind. Within their mind, they're still thinking themselves independent. So, it's not just simply giving up possessions. In the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes different kinds of sacrifice. And he said, greater than the sacrifice of material possessions is the sacrifice of knowledge. So, not everybody who comes and surrenders to Krishna has proper knowledge. Sometimes people come with material motives and sometimes people come to, to get away from problems. Sometimes, you know, people come, to, oh, I want to get away from my family, they give me so much trouble, I will just surrender to Krishna. So that kind of surrender is motivating. I give up everything. What do you have? Well, I have my house, I haven't paid the, you know, it's not paid for, my car is not paid for, I give it all up, I give it to you. <laughs> but, you know, it's not paid for, you have to pay it, you have to take over the responsibility. So you have to be careful about surrendering everything. Surrendering everything, Atmani Vedanam comes only after somebody is very strong in the other angas of bhakti. These two limbs, Sakyam and Atmani Vedanam, they are meant for people who have achieved the level of uh, Raganuga bhakti. They've come to the level of spontaneous devotional service. They're not just simply doing sadhana, but they're actually on the higher level because you cannot become a friend of Krishna very easily. And, and similarly, to give up everything, that is very high level of devotion. Give up your own life, become a sold out animal, that is the implication. So to do that, you have to be very developed in Krishna consciousness before you can practice that kind of devotion. So people give up possessions, it's not as good as somebody who is in knowledge, who is cultivated knowledge. Uh, 
how to be balanced about spiritual life and this life. And we have the past and the future. How can we learn this balance? How can we learn? Balance. The balance. Well, it's important for us to hear about Lord Krishna. We hear about Lord Krishna that it helps us to purify ourselves, to understand that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord and we are his servants. Our, our real business is to hear the pastimes of Lord Krishna, to take pleasure in remembering them, thinking about them, how Krishna is so wonderful. And at the same time, we are serving Krishna, we are connected to Krishna by devotional service. So it's not enough to just simply uh, think I'm a devotee, we have to know why we're devotees, why are we worshipping Krishna, why are we chanting Krishna's name, because Krishna is so wonderful. And we just thought we're so attracted to Krishna, we take so much pleasure in hearing about Krishna. And when we hear the pastimes of Lord Krishna, then it increases our pleasure. It gives us more pleasure, more satisfaction. If we didn't know about Krishna, we'd wonder why we're chanting his name every day. You know, if you don't know any Leela of Krishna, you don't know what's, what Krishna did and who he was, oh, we just chant, it's just a sound, we just chant, you know. It's just a sound. Yeah. It wouldn't be the same. But the more we know about Krishna and his activities, then the more we develop our attraction for Krishna, and the more we develop the taste for chanting. People often say, oh, I have no taste for chanting. Why you don't have any taste? Because you never read the books. You, know, you don't know anything about Krishna. So you have no taste. So we have to hear. We have to hear regularly. And we should become attached to hearing and to chanting also, to talking about Krishna. That's, that's desired. The more we're speaking about Krishna, then the more our life is transcendental. But if we're not thinking of Krishna, then we think of Maya. You don't think of Krishna, you just think of Maya. You don't think of Krishna, how Krishna kidnapped Rukmini. What do we think? We think about some movie star or some big businessman and, you know, oh, you know, this one married that one and, the, oh, you know, just total material, mundane, all the gramya kata. You think about these big movie stars and these big business magnets and their pastimes, you take birth again in the material world. But you think about Krishna and what Krishna did, then you don't take birth again. You won't come back again. So it makes a big, that makes a big difference. You hear about, you hear, you don't hear about Krishna, you hear about all the wrong people. Nonsense talk breeds nonsense thought. And nonsense thought breeds nonsense action. And nonsense action means again, birth, old age, disease and death. But when we hear about Krishna and his activities, then tagvadeham punarjanma naiti mamiti so arjuna. You never have to take birth again. Of course, we have to understand Krishna's pastimes are all transcendental. It's all transcendental activities, it's not mundane. So that's why we have to hear about Krishna. We understand how powerful Krishna is. We should be fascinated by him. Everything else in this world is just some dim reflection, an imitation. People are just imitating the Leela of Krishna.
No question. Better to easier to become a demon than to become a devotee. <laughs> yes, but you have to understand those demons who are in Krishna's pastimes, they're very special personalities. They're not ordinary kind of people. They're very special. Of course, they're, they're not properly situated, but still somehow they get connected to Krishna. You become a demon, what will be your result? You'll simply enter into the lower species of life, birth after birth. You become demon, if you take the demon nature, the Bhagavad Gita describes, you enter into the lower species and you take birth repeatedly in the lower species of life. You're not going to go to the Brahma Jyoti. Those were very special demons who went to, they were killed by Krishna. You become a demon, you're just going to become a, a tree, a hog, a dog, a snake, a scorpion. You'll get these kind of bodies. It's your choice. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Any other question? Maharaj uh, sometimes wonder, if we heard past times of Krishna, we are hearing for many years. So, we might, we have not yet developed so much attraction to Krishna. So, from the perspective of devotee, so, how to see what can be Well, the fact that you're hearing regularly, you keep hearing, and you stay in the Krishna consciousness movement means that you have something, you definitely develop some taste for Krishna, you have some attraction for Krishna. It may not be fully purified or pu fully fructified, but you just have to stay. You have to stay, at, hold on into this Krishna consciousness movement. That's our lifeline. It's our only hope. If you go away from the Krishna consciousness movement, then you have no hope. But so long as you're here in this Krishna conscious society, we may not be you know, so absorbed in that bhava as Rukmini, but still we're here, we have a hope. Prabhupada gives the example, the green mango, that gradually it will become the right mango. It just takes some time. So the same way, we're, you know, we may be the green mango, but with time, the mango will ripen. So that will happen. We, we, we have to stay alive. That's another point which is made, yeah? Tate Nukampam, Bunjana Ivatma, like that. Stay alive. What does the man have to do to inherit the property of the father? They simply have to stay alive. So in the same way, you want to go back to Godhead, you want to go to the spiritual world, 
You just have to stay alive. Stay in this Krishna consciousness movement and keep yourself alive by service. You know, keep up that utsahan. That's important. The utsahan, that enthusiasm is very important for us. Keep up that enthusiasm. You know, don't think, well, I did all this before. Oh, I did. Yeah, it's going to take time. It's going to take some time. 10 years, 20 years. It's nothing compared to eternal time. We are Nitya Bada. We are eternally conditioned souls. But we can become Jivan Mukta. We have the opportunity. Go on. One day we will become Jivan Mukta. You become the liberated soul. Now we're Nitya Bada, but we don't have to remain Nitya Bada. We're Nitya Bada because we've been in this world so long, we say Nitya Bada. But it's not that we have to remain Nitya Bada. We can be transformed, we can be changed, we can become Jivan Mukta. But it needs our effort. We have to make, we have to, we have to keep up the desire. Just like Prabhupada, Prabhupada was in India, you know, he's 70 years old. He'd been a devotee, he took initiation in 1933. He had the desire. He didn't give up the desire. He was always trying. He was trying to do something. You know, he never got success. He didn't get anywhere. He went to Jansi, tried to do something in Jansi. He was trying different things. He couldn't do anything. Finally, he went to America. It came at the end. You have to be patient. It can come. It can happen. You, but you have to hold, you have to be ready. Prabhupada said, Krishna can give you the whole world. Are you ready? Are you ready to rule the world, to take the world? So according to our qualification, Krishna gives. We have to become more qualified, more eligible for the service of Krishna. And Krishna will give us greater and greater opportunities. Ten years is nothing in eternal time. <laughs> to be cowherd boys, the cowherd boys who are with Lord Krishna, they had performed pious activities over many lifetimes. And now they were with Lord Krishna. So we have to be patient and at the same time enthusiastic and determined. Very important. Okay. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Uh, 